cannot believe that I'm here. Oh, I've been waiting for this for literally like a year. I found out that I was coming in March or April of last year and it is now January and I'm finally here and I'm so freaking excited. I can't even believe that this is happening. Like <sighs> dream come true. For real, dream come true. I wanted to take you guys along for the Get Your Teach On experience. I'm not gonna be vlogging in the sessions because, well, you're not allowed to, but even if you were allowed to, I don't want to vlog during them. I want to just, you know, be there and soak it all up and learn as much as I can. But I am planning on kind of like sitting down like this and debriefing with you guys at the end of each day. So today is Sunday, January 19th, and I am in LA for the Get Your Teach On conference. And like just saying that right now is like, I can't even believe it. I just can't even believe it. It's so exciting. So the town that I live in is like an hour outside of LA. So me and my coworker drove here and got here at like four. We checked in and there was like the giant get your teach on letters and there was all the magic squad and they were all like hyping everyone up and there was fun music playing and um, we registered, which means we got our little like get your teach on badge, which gets you into all of the sessions apparently. And it's super cute. I love the colors of this. Um, and then there was a bunch of like merchandise that you could buy and little swag and there was all the vendors set up like um, really good stuff and um, Nearpod and like just some things like that and then of course there was t-shirts to buy so you know how to get some so I got the I've got the magic shirt this is the softest material I think I'm gonna wear this tomorrow and then I also got my favorite one it says if you've got time to lurk you got time to work love that one and then i also got this really cool notepad it's from berto and co and it says hi i'm very proud of blank for collaborating working hard following instructions listening participating or there's like a space for you to write something else and then you can leave a note and the reason that i really love this is because one of them ah, one of them you write on and you can send this one home and then the other one there's like a carbon paper for you to have a copy of it the reason that I got sold on this is because the owner told me that he saw people using this on Instagram by sending the top one home as a note, like a positive note home for a parent, and then the bottom one, the copy part as a bulletin board, so like a classroom community kind of like shout out center. Um, I thought that was really cool. And I actually have that bulletin board in my classroom, like right by my door, the one that said we are family, and I was putting the pictures on it. It's, it's too much to keep up with. So I think this would be better because I can kind of kill two birds with one stone, have one for my bulletin board, and then also give the parents and the kiddo like a nice little shout out, message home kind of thing. So that's what I got today. And then tomorrow the sessions start at eight o'clock. Um, there's not any keynotes, which I was expecting there to be, but maybe that's just for like the national conference. So I'm gonna walk you guys through the little sessions that I have tomorrow. So from eight to 9.30, I have set the stage to engage reimagined with Hope and Wade King. 9.40 to 11, make social studies important again with Lini Shatab. I'm super excited for that one. I follow her on Instagram and I love her. Um, 11.10 to 12.20, Steam Mania with Amy Lemons. Then there's lunch. And then at 1.30 to 2.50, get techie with it with Chris Pombano. And then 3 to 4.30 is math more than a worksheet with Amy Lemons. So those are the sessions that I'm going to be at tomorrow. And then I'll share with you guys the one for day two um, tomorrow night after I debrief with you guys. But... I'm just so excited and this is also kind of like a weird like uncomfortable like stepping out of my comfort zone thing because there's so many people here that I follow on Instagram and some of them follow me and a lot of them I've talked to or talked to regularly but I've never met them so it's like this awkward thing where it's like I know them but I don't know them and they don't know me but they know me and it's just like I don't know it's just this weird nerve-wracking experience of like I hope that in person i am what they hoped i would be based on what they know me online you know what i mean i don't know i'm just really excited to learn a bunch of cool stuff that i can take back to my classroom and share with my colleagues and my students and just get excited about teaching again oh i forgot to tell you the best part of tonight besides meeting some of my new friends from instagram um we went to this restaurant called public school and it's like school themed and so there was like chalkboards everywhere and the menu was a composition notebook and there was like globes everywhere and there was a projector and like a screen that pulled down just like in a classroom their happy hour was called recess <laughs> like everything was just school themed and it was so so cute the bathrooms had wallpaper that was all like science and beakers and it was just the coolest place so if you're in la or i think they have more locations because there was like a number afterwards i think it was 
like a chain type restaurant so if you ever see one you definitely need to check it out and the food was so so good and it was actually pretty cheap so and then it was really cool too because they had this whole shelf with all these games on them so we got to play jenga while we were waiting for our food and the jenga pieces had like naughty things written on them or like questions and it was just funny and silly so that's it for day one i'm gonna put you guys down so i can get some sleep and get rested for my big day tomorrow and i can't wait to share with you guys everything that i learned and with that I'm out. Good night. into the room from the first day of all the sessions and first of all I want to apologize for the lighting right now because there's no overhead light there's only a light on the side of me but I thought this was like a cool backdrop to do this video in but I just wanted to sit down with you guys and kind of debrief the day and tell you guys my favorite things that I learned from each session I took a ton of notes so I don't know if you guys can tell how many pages that is <laughs> Yeah, that didn't work, but it's a ton. So I'm just gonna go over this kind of fast. Um, and then as I'm editing, I'll throw in some pictures for you guys um, on the screen that I took of like the slides that they had up or different games that we were playing so you guys can get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So we started the morning with Hope and Wade King and I'm just gonna kind of redo my notes and kind of explain if I need to. So it was probably the perfect session to start this conference with because it was almost like it was just like a keynote speech where you're listening and getting rejuvenated and getting excited. And then they talked about um, this acronym MAGIC. This is actually my absolute favorite part of their session because I feel like I got so much out of it. Sometimes, like when I went to Ron Clark Academy, I saw little bits and pieces because you're not in sessions. Some of them are sessions, but some of them you were just in classrooms for just a small chunk of time. So you got to see some of these things that they talked about in practice, but you didn't get to see the beginning or the end or even the teacher themselves explaining kind of the purpose behind it or how they built up to it. So. Um, magic i'm going to go over what each letter stands for and what they talked about so with this magic they talked about teaching one in isolation and then building upon that and doing the next one so you'll see they kind of all like build on each other um they they said definitely not to just throw all this at your students at once and expect them to do it um but all of the tips in this acronym are all for building that classroom community so the m is make eye contact so not just with the teacher, but anytime that another student is sharing an idea or another student is speaking, that it's important for the students to look at them and turn their bodies. Um, and one thing that they suggested to do this is like, say you're doing a math lesson and you ask a question and um, the students raise their hand and you call on one person, then you're going to give them the floor and have all the students know to go and look at them by saying, Jessica has the floor and the students would clap twice and say, ooh, watch her, watch her and point at the student. And that's kind of their cue to all give that student their attention. And then as that student is sharing their idea, if the students agree with what they're saying, then they're going to take their two thumbs and just shake it. And that's not only for the person who's speaking to know, okay, I'm kind of on the right track, but it's also for the teacher to see who else is getting it. And then if they disagree, instead of giving a thumbs down because that's negative, then you just kind of make like the mm sign and that's the sign to show that you disagree. So then if that student sees that a student is disagreeing with them, they can ask them right then and there. Instead of the teacher having to be the one to facilitate, you know, oh, why did you disagree? The student themselves can actually take ownership and say, oh, you know, Ashley, I noticed that you were disagreeing with me. Can you share with me your perspective? Or even if they see everyone's agreeing with them or if they want to call on someone who agrees, who agrees with them, they can say, um, like for example, if we're solving a math problem and there's multiple ways to solve, they can say, okay, Tommy, um, you know, I saw that you agreed with me. Can you give me another way that we could solve that? Or can you give me another example of a time that this strategy would work or something like that where they get to be the leaders? Um, and I really like that they talked about this, that it's okay for students to be wrong. So if a student raises their hand, shares an answer, and most of the students agree with them, it's okay for them to experience that it's okay to be wrong you don't always have to be right you can't only share your ideas when you know that you're going to be right because those valuable learning experiences are in the times where you're wrong too 
um, and that leads perfectly into the A part of the MAGIC acronym, which is accept failures and learn from mistakes. So giving students opportunities to fail, but building them up with small victories. So say I raise my hand, I share my answer, you know, people are disagreeing with me or I get the answer wrong, then me as the teacher should facilitate a discussion where I'm helping them build up to that answer and giving them a chance to succeed along the way. So if we're doing a math problem and they're stuck on a step, we could say, oh, you know, remember yesterday when we did X, Y, and Z, how could we use that to help us here? And then hopefully that will give the student a chance to be like, oh yeah, okay, and then start going. And then you can build them up. Yeah, good job. The next part is G, which stands for get up and go for it. So when the students are sharing their answers, they should stand up when they're speaking. Um, they're talking to the class, not the teacher. So if I ask the question, I know the answer. Therefore, they're not talking to me. They're sharing their answer with the rest of the class. So they shouldn't be facing me, they should be facing the rest of the group. And in order for that to be a little bit easier for the students to kind of grasp onto, don't ask a question right in front of the student because then they're going to be talking to you and that kind of makes it just more private between the two of you. But if you're asking from a further place in the classroom, then it's involving more people. The I stands for there is no I in team. Every child is a participant in the community and is a valuable part of that community. Um, which means every child should be raising their hand even if they don't know and one thing that Hope shared is that she tries to call on students at the beginning when they're kind of implementing this strategy she calls on students who don't have their hand raised so that next time they're gonna raise their hand even if they don't know because they're gonna know she's gonna call on me if I don't raise my hand so I'm gonna raise it in the hopes that I don't get called on even if they're the kind of kid who doesn't want to get called on um, and eventually they'll just start raising their hand all the time and even if you do call on them and they don't know, again, like we just talked about, that's an opportunity for them to grow and learn. Um, oh, I liked this too. Um, after you call on a child, no one else can raise their hand. So it's no longer a class question, it's just that person's question. So if I get called on in class, it's my question, therefore I'm the one that has to work it out. And instead of the kids just all sitting there being like, do do do, you know, waiting for them to get the right answer, especially if they're struggling, their job is to celebrate and give that student positive energy while that student is thinking. So we do this in my class, but sometimes it feels forced because they'll be like, good job, Jess. And then the rest will be like, good job, Jess. Instead of just that authentic like you got this come on you can do this so that's something that we're still working on and can kind of be awkward to figure out how to get them to get out of that kind of robotic way of saying it but I know in my classroom it does give the students a little bit of extra think time when the students are cheering them on uh, because it's not just like that awkward like <laughs> jeopardy moment where the song's playing and they're just sitting there waiting and everyone's waiting on them and they feel awkward and pressured to answer uh, but they're getting that positivity and that um, praise that they can do it um, stick with that student, don't give up on them, give them scaffolding to help them understand. So kind of what we just talked about, giving them little refreshers like, oh, remember when we did this? How could we use this strategy? And giving them hints because if you tell a student, do you want to just phone a friend or just call on someone else? Then you're telling that student, not only do your classmates not believe in you because they're all raising their hand when you're supposed to be answering, but that shows you that I don't believe in you. So stick with that student, don't call on somebody else, help scaffold to get them to where they need to be. And that teaches them that hard work plus determination equals success. The C stands for celebrating others. So um, they shared a cheer and chant to do when a student does answer a question. And I thought this was really cute. So the teacher would say, Jess, that answer was hot. And then the rest of the students would say, ice is cold, but fire is not. She's fire. She's hot. And then I think they're supposed to clap or slam their hands down, but I don't think I wrote that down. So you want to add a little clap at the end um, you could do that um, when you're doing chants and cheers and celebrating each other um, the students should be looking at the student who's getting that so that they're giving that student their positive energy um, and I really like this quote that I wrote down that Hope said she said when you give a student a moment in the Sun they want to shine so when you give them those opportunities to be successful when you give them opportunities to have their classmates cheering for them and building them up they're gonna want to do it more because that feeling of being successful and being the one that's getting praised and cheered on feels really good even as an adult so um, creating opportunities for your students to feel like that is really important um, they talked about consistency like in all these chants and cheers and call and responses um, making the students say it again until it's good, until it's good enough for what you want it to be at the best time that they're doing it, if that makes sense. Um, I'm sorry if I'm kind of rambling or if some of the things I'm saying don't make sense because I am so tired. Today was exhausting. Um, even though it was only four sessions, it just felt like so much. Each one of them was an hour and a half and then we had an hour and 10 minutes for lunch and it started at eight o'clock this morning and it's just been like, go, 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 go. So my brain is kind of like coming down off all the high energy right now. Um, 
So anyways, being consistent, having students repeat things. So if you do a call and response or if you do a chant and cheer and the students are kind of like, she's fire, she's hot, then making them do it again. Because if you accept less than 100%, if you accept less than what you actually want, then that becomes the new norm. That becomes what they know that they can get away with. And um, yeah, you always want students to know what they can expect from you. Um, they talked about um, using simple hand gestures to redirect students. So like if a student isn't making eye contact with a student, instead of stopping the instructional minutes and being like, Tommy, you know that you're supposed to make eye contact and you need to turn your body and this is a sign of respect, all that kind of stuff, that's a waste of time. You don't want to stop instruction to do that. You can just give a simple hand gesture. Like you can just walk over and be like, Tommy, you know, eye, eye contact. And that's all you need to say and then they'll pick up on it. Okay, so the call and response expectations. The first one is I must call with energy. I, as the teacher, need to be energetic and have that enthusiasm that I expect from the students. The students have to respond with energy as well. Um, their hands on, are always on the table afterwards. So the ones that we learned, all the call and responses and cheers, they always have the students like hit their hands on the desk afterwards because then they're not fiddling with like scissors, pencils, highlighters, anything like that. And their eyes have to be on the teacher and then they have to stay frozen for three seconds so that sets an expectation that after i do a call and response it's not like oh yeah that was a good one good job i did a call and response because i need your attention so that means i need to get it from you right then um and then i actually recorded a video of them that they said it was okay to record of them actually doing the call and responses so i'm just going to put that in here so you guys can see what call and responses they shared with us and that way i don't have to try to recreate them so i'm going to play that for you guys right now Alpha five. Aye, aye, aye. Um, next one, do it for the double class. Back, back, down. down. And then boom. Remember, they're frozen for three seconds. Ninos. Ninos. Hands on the table. Give me your attention. This is the one where they get to stand and move a little bit. So it's give me your attention. Let's pay attention. Yeah. Let's pay attention. Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, the next thing that they shared about was the environment. So they were talking about room transformations and they really kind of just glossed over this because I think they didn't want to make it like the focus because I think what people think about this conference is that it's all just fluff. It's all just for looks. It's just cute and it's just about decorating the room, but it's really a lot more than that. Um, and I'm really seeing that more than ever now that I'm here and learning from them. Um, so room transformations are a teaching strategy to deepen content. Um, I remember she said something like, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? And her students said, Walmart and the Dollar Tree, which blew her mind because they hadn't never been out of the community that they lived in. So she said, if I can't take them out in the world, I'm going to bring the world to them. Um, doing room transformations creates an experience for the kids. It doesn't have to be over the top and it must focus on content. And um, she said something about teaching the kids to respect the environment. Um, I put in quotes, you do not have to learn like this, you get to learn like this. And that was something that totally hit home for me because a lot of times that I've done room transformations, I spend a lot of time on it. Sometimes I spend money on them too. And it can be really frustrating when the kids are just kind of crazy and chaotic because I didn't set up the right expectation with them of what my expectations were about how they were going to treat the room, how they were going to treat the materials, how they were going to treat me and each other and respect our time and the things that we're supposed to be learning. Um, so I like that they mentioned that. And then she talked about too, like if you're doing a room transformation or really anything that's fun and different and your kids aren't being respectful and aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, then give them one warning. If they still aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, then you have to stop it. So she said something about she was doing some kind of like spy room, I think she said, where the lights were off and she had lasers and this one class wasn't respecting her. So she gave them one warning. They still weren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So she turned the lights back on and they learned in a different way. And then the next time when she was going to do it, the kids were like, hey, we need to be on it because we know she's going to turn the lights off. She means business or turn the lights on. So we need to do what we're supposed to be doing. And then they said that at hopeandwadeking.com, um, they have information about all the room transformations that they've done if you wanted that. So that's free information that you don't have to come to the conference to get. So I appreciate that they didn't spend a whole bunch of time on something that I could just go online and learn myself. 
oh, she showed this really cool thing called Unlock the Magic. And I'm gonna put a picture of it here so you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about. So this is a cool classroom management strategy. You can see she has like the little fence with keys on them. And then she went to Home Depot and made six keys for each lock and only one worked. And then she tied little ribbons to the end of them. So there was like six green keys, six red keys, six blue keys, whatever, but only one of them would open the lock. And then all trimester long students could earn keys. They were paper keys, that way students didn't lose them. And then at the end, um, they could turn in their keys and they would. she would do a random drawing. I think that's what she said, if I understood right. She would do a random drawing for a key. Whoever's name it was could come pick a key and then try to see if it opened the lock. If they got the one that opened the lock, then they would get a reward. She was able to take them like off campus to a movie or pizza or something. But if you can't do that, she said, you know, go play a game with them at lunch or have lunch with a teacher or have some kind of small reward that you are able to do if you can't take your kids off campus or do something kind of like over the top like that. Um, and she said not everyone wins and that's important for kids to learn too that um, people always ask her like what do you do if a kid melts down because his key doesn't work and she said that's a great lesson for them i'll give them a hug and sometimes they get upset but you need to have kids learn that it's not always their time to shine and that it's time to celebrate others when they win so teaching kids to build each other up in their moment instead of focusing on the fact that they lost and that's a really valuable tool for when they get older too because we all know adults who can't lose and who get really upset and who can't be happy for each other i feel like especially in this profession we see it all the time because you know if you do a cool lesson and you do something over the top amazing for your kids you're gonna be faced hopefully not but in my experience you're gonna be faced with teachers who are jealous and say negative things and just really bring you down instead of building you up and being excited that you created a really awesome experience for your students um, so that was all for Hope and Wade King session I'm gonna try to speed up a little bit because I've already been talking for like 15 minutes um, but this is what I really wanted this whole vlog to be about, sharing the ideas that I learned so you guys could take them back and use them in your classroom too, even if you weren't able to come to the conference. So sorry if I'm blabbing, but I'm trying to give you guys as much information as possible. Um, so the next one was from Lanisha Tab. I was so excited for this one and it did not disappoint. So she shared a lot of really good quotes and I took a lot of pictures, so I'm gonna put them in here somehow for you guys so you guys can see them. Um, but she talked a lot about how to blend in the five social studies topics, which are economics, sociology, geography, history, and civics, which is what her and um, Naomi, I think is her name, Naomi from Read Like a Rockstar. That's kind of what they have broken social studies down into. She recommended reading the book um, Lies My Teacher Told Me. And she really emphasized the importance of not teaching heroes over everything else. So not making social studies something that is like, softened for kids you know the point of it isn't to scare them the point of them isn't to make history a bad thing the point is to tell them the truth they understand the world around us and how to do better um when analyzing history it's important to ask whose voice was left out and why and then how can we find those voices um this helps them personalize history and we're not teaching them what to think we're teaching them how to think oh i liked this a lot she said that when we are looking at history textbooks, a lot of time the history that we're learning about is authoritative history. I'm the teacher, I'm giving you the information, I'm telling you what happened and you will need to memorize those facts and then be able to regurgitate them. But we're, we weren't there and we don't have all the sides of the story and it's a really important to take a look at who wrote the history and why they might have written it the way they did and who they left out of the stories. And she said history should end with more questions so students should be able to critically think about the things that they're learning instead of just accepting what you're telling them is the truth. They should be able to look at it from different perspectives. Um, she talked about appreciating cultures, not appropriating, so honoring the historical value and really understanding where things are coming from that you're using from your classroom. Um, something she talked about was, um, like for example, using sugar schools at Halloween. If you're just kind of cherry picking a cute craft from Pinterest and not really understanding where that comes from and the purpose of it and what it means to that culture, that is appropriation. Um, when she was talking about civics, she said that um, students need to know their rights and responsibilities as people. Um, she shared an example of a culture case or a culture flip book for older grades if you didn't want to do as much prep. Um, something that you could send home to help students understand their culture and um, that's something that they can bring back and then share with their classmates and that helps not only their classmates understand that student better but you as well. Um, she talked about a student that had come from 
I can't remember which country she said it was in the Middle East and she was all of a sudden plopped down into this classroom in Denver and she was kind of labeled a behavior problem because she didn't want to work with a group but the school that she came from was an all-girls school so now that she was being asked to partner with you know little Tommy it was uncomfortable for her because it was something that was really foreign to her and wasn't a part of her um, culture and wasn't accepted so when she found that out then she found out okay the student is not being a discipline problem the student is not being defiant I was not giving her what she needed based on her culture um and I like that she mentioned that instead of an all about me bag in the beginning of the year they can share who they really are by doing some kind of culture um flip book where they're able to talk with their family about what their culture is all about and then sharing that with the class and it was really cool actually she gifted that to us so she shared it with us on google drive so that we could use it in our classroom so i'm definitely going to be using that um i really like this too because um when kids are sharing about their culture it teaches the other kids to respect differences um that not everyone is like you even if you teach in a school where the students mostly look like each other even then students aren't all the same she gave a great example of one time where she was teaching in a primarily white school and um one of the students was talking about what they did on sunday and she was saying something like we go to the park and then we go here and then another student said well after you go to church right and the other student was like no we don't go to church and so that was like a big eye-opener for the other student that oh not everybody goes to church not everybody is like me and does things the same way that i do um let's see um when talking about black history do not start with slavery you need to balance the struggle and celebration because there's a lot of beautiful things that happened in that culture way before slavery so making sure to talk about that too because if you only share the negative things of a culture then the students of that culture in your class are going to take that in and that's not going to feel good for them um and there's so much to celebrate in every culture so finding those things and making sure to share those um she shared for some kids it's about representation and for other kids it's about perspective so um even if you're teaching in a school where all the students look like each other then they're going to need perspective on other cultures because they don't have a lot of opportunity that's not the word i'm looking for but that'll work opportunity to see people that are different from them so you can sh you can give that to them by giving them perspective about other cultures um she shared to remain unbiased you can use keywords like these ones from the picture i'm going to put in there and then she said give the facts and then get out of there and put it on the students and say what do you all think instead of sharing your opinions and your beliefs because your job isn't to persuade your students to think one way or the other your job is not to teach them what to think it's to teach them how to think um and something that she shared that I really loved was that if they're old enough to experience injustice, then they're old enough to learn about it and talk about it. So um, that's something that I really appreciated and I, I'm so happy that I got to see her session because I teach in a pretty conservative district. And so um, to me, it's pretty pretty scary to, to think about having conversations about injustice and equality and race and all these things because I've done it in the past and I've gotten so much backlash from parents. Um, so one thing that she shared too was to give parents a preview of materials, books, um, lesson ideas, lesson plans, whatever you have to do to make your parents feel comfortable with what you're going to be talking about because they know ahead of time instead of just their kid comes home and they pull something out of their backpack or the kid says, we learned about this today. Um, especially because I know from my experience, um, kids are kids and so they're not always going to completely understand what you say or sometimes they're going to misconstrue what you said and then go home and say something completely different and that could get you in trouble. So um, that was it for Lenny Shatab. She shared so many amazing quotes, so I am going to actually put some of those in here. I took a bunch of pictures on my phone um, because I wanted to share a lot of the amazing information that she gave. So I'm going to share those pictures now with you guys, and then I'll talk about the next session.
Okay, I just realized we actually had five hour and a half sessions today because yeah, I had Hope and Wade King, Lanisha Tubb, Amy Lemons did a Steam Mania. Um, most of that was just activities that we did. I'm actually gonna skip past that one. Not that I didn't think it was cool, but I just, without having the stuff here, I don't feel like it's as valuable to you guys, so I'm gonna skip past that one. Um, and then we had a tech session with Chris Pombano, and then Amy Lemons came back and did a really cool math session with us. So I'm gonna share with you guys about the tech session right now from Chris. He also did a call and response to start off, so the teacher says, five, four, three, two, one, and the students say, and we're done, and then slap the table. He also did another one where the teacher says, shut down, and then the students are going, hmm, and like melt down to the table, and then pause for a couple seconds, and then the teacher says, reboot, and then the students say, loading, 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 and then smack the table. I thought that one would be cool, and he mentioned something about that time in between before you make them reboot, kind of gives both of you guys a chance to kind of like, refresh your brain and get in the right mindset to switch to something different. So kind of having a little pause. Um, so this session was all about technology and he mentioned that um, technology should enhance what we're doing, not replace it. So he broke it into four categories, um, test, engage, create, and help. And that is an acronym for tech. So he shared so many amazing apps and websites and I'm gonna share all of them with you, although I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on some of them. And then the other ones you guys can check out on your own. So the first part of the acronym is TEST. And he said, tech is the best way to trick students into giving us a formative assessment. So if you are doing something at the beginning of a unit or to see how your students are understanding it, use one of these fun tech tools that's gonna get them engaged and get them excited and doesn't feel like, oh my gosh, another test, but that you're still gonna get valuable data from. So the first app that he shared or website, some of them I'm not sure if they're apps or websites, but I'll share with you if I do know. Edpuzzle, I'm not sure which one that is. So depending on if you have Chromebooks or iPads or whatever you have, um, some of these may not work. So I have Chromebooks, my school is one-to-one, -one, or my whole district actually. So some of these don't work for me because I don't have iPads. Oh, but he did mention, kind of getting off track here, but that's okay. A lot of people that he knows that have gone to this conference um, have gone back and then posted on social media asking their friends and family for like old iPhones or old iPods that they're no longer using to see if they could donate because a lot of these you only need Wi-Fi to use. Um, Actually, I think that's true with any app. You only need Wi-Fi to use apps, so even if you don't have like a SIM card or a service on the phone, you can still use them if you have Wi-Fi. Um, so Edpuzzles one, I didn't write any notes on that and I've never used it, so I'm not sure anything about it. I'd have to look into it, but I'm assuming since I didn't write any notes down, I wasn't able to use it. I don't know. I did take a lot of pictures of slides, and like I said, we've learned so much information today that if I say something wrong, then I'm gonna fix it and put a picture of something or whatever on here. So um, if I did take a picture of an app or how to use it, I'll put it on here for you guys. Um, oh, this one was cool. So this one's called Plickers. Basically, each student gets assigned a QR code. So if I have 21 students in my class, then I'll put all 21 in there. And then each one will assign them a QR code and you print out the whole page. So like if I put in Jessica for number one, then I need to make sure that I as Jessica get the one that says number one because each one is going to um, be scanned in under each student. I don't think that made sense, let me explain. So there's a letter on each side, so I'm just gonna grab this. So if this is the QR code, then each side is correlated to a letter choice that they can um, choose to answer from whatever like quiz or whatever you're doing. So um, he would place this on the back of a composition notebook or a folder or something and then on the inside of the folder he would put a b c and d so the students knew which one they were scanning it'll make sense in a second so then i'll put up a question on the board there'll be four choices depending on which one they choose say they want to choose c then they'll have to turn their plicker code so that it's facing like this side would be c and then the cool thing is is that you only need one device so if you have no devices in your classroom like if you don't have chromebooks or iphones iphones <laughs> iPads um, or iPhones, I guess, then you can still use this as long as you have one piece of technology. So then all I have to do as a teacher is just have the students all holding up their clicker QR code on whatever side letter they wanna answer. I just quickly scan the room, like he said it was literally that fast, and it will automatically put the information from the QR code into their name on my phone. And I can see exactly who got it and exactly who didn't. So if I wanted to do a really quick formative assessment and just see what my small group needs to be for that specific day, that's a really easy way I could do it. I just quickly scan and then I have all the data. So that was really, really cool. I'm gonna definitely be using that. But that's why it's important that you give, like if, if 
this QR code, pretend this is a QR code. If this QR code goes to whoever I put into slot number one, then I need to make sure that that goes to them because when I scan the QR code, the information from this QR code is gonna go into whatever student number I gave it to. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, let me know. I know I'm going kind of fast. <sighs> okay. Um, he also talked about quizzes. So you can use that for homework and kids can use a code to log in and can practice multiple times. And it shows them a leaderboard of like who's on top. So say, there was 10 questions and a kid got third place, then he can do it again so he can try to get a better score and get first place. So even though it creates kind of a competitive environment, it's causing your students to play that game multiple times and get that information multiple times. So I think that's worth it. Um, Quizlet Live, if you haven't heard of that, um, it's basically a way to um, group students. It groups and form based on animals. And one thing he shared that I really liked is that instead of um, like the way I do it, I have all my students stand on the stage. They see what group they're in when I press start game and then I'll physically tell them like, okay, the giraffes are going to go at the small table. The flamingos are going to go on the futon. Instead of that, he has them act out based on which animal they got. So like if it was an elephant, they'd all have to like do some, <laughs> something that is do something that looks like an elephant so that they can find who else is an elephant and then they can pick where to sit, but they have to do it silently. So I feel like that is definitely something that I'm gonna try when I get back. You can also have students not sit together so that they have to work alone, um, even if they're still in group mode. So they're still earning points as a team. And if you haven't played Quizlet, it basically, um, like if there's four kids in a group, it'll give all four kids different answers from the whole different quiz. And then only one of them has the right answer. So they have to kind of work together to be like, do I have it? No, okay, do you have, okay, yeah, that's, that one's it. So if they're not sitting together, then they just have to know it. But if they click on the wrong answer and their team's gonna lose points. So they really wanna make sure that they know it. Um, Gim Kit is something that I actually was going to share with you guys soon that one of my coworkers found. Um, it's really cool. It's kind of like Kahoot, except the kids don't have to wait for each other to answer each question. Wow, I am talking so much. I can see the time up here. Whew, sorry, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Um, the kids don't have to wait for each student to answer all of the questions, and they can earn money for every question they get right, but they can buy things with the money, like they can freeze another player's computer, or they can, um, I think they can like buy to get like a higher percentage or something. I don't, I don't really know all of them. I just played it for the first time the other day. Um, but it's really cool and the kids really like it. And then he shared um, about Nearpod and vocabulary, which apparently they're joining companies right now. And I'm gonna put a picture up here of a link that you guys can use too. And they said it was okay to share. So I'm not gonna get in trouble for this, but um, you guys can get a free subscription to Nearpod and Vocabulary. I think it lasts for three months. Um, Nearpod basically allows you to put slides like your Google slides, your PowerPoint slides into this Nearpod deck and then share it with your students. And you can either have them do that like for a sub. If you don't wanna have the sub try to figure out the lesson plan, you can have the kids do it. Or you can just have the kids have the lesson on their screen so they can follow along with you, but you can freeze it so that they can't move ahead of you. And then vocabulary is amazing videos. I absolutely love vocabulary, but it's like a hundred dollars a year. So I never have it. I've just found videos that they have on YouTube until they get deleted. <laughs> um, but vocabulary is basically like rap videos for every content subject. And they're really, really good. Um, one of the things that he shared was called charades. Um, you all know how to play charades. If you don't, you can Google it really quick, but that's what he was saying that we could ask for old iPhones or iPads from or iPods, sorry, um, for family and friends. It's like the game where, you know, you have one person have the phone on their head and then the other person tries to explain what's on there. So you could do that for so many different things. Um, vocab definitely comes to mind. Um, oh, this one was really cool. Chatter picks or chatter picks kids. So, um, you take a picture of the kid and then they put sound over it and then you say where the mouth is and then it makes the mouth move so it looks like the kid's talking. Um, you don't have to do this with pictures of the kids. You could have them do this, like if you're gonna have them do a biography, then you could find a picture on Google of the person that they're gonna be talking about and then have the kid do the voiceover for it. You could do it at the beginning of the year to have kids introduce themselves to each other. Oh, we talked about this website called ifaketextmessage.com. So it basically looks like a text conversation from an iPhone. So he throws this up on his like morning slide to tell the kids what to do. You could also use this when you're learning about dialogue or to talk about characters. Um, I was thinking that I could use this after I read a text and then they could create a conversation between the two characters of like what they think would happen next. Um, I thought that would be pretty fun. Um, he shared about Flipgrid. It's basically like a YouTube for kids, but it's just in your classroom, but kids get to create their own videos. 
Um, and he said the website has a parent consent form, so you can just send that home in case kids are going home being like, we made a YouTube video today, and the parents are like, what? Uh, so it's already done for you. One thing that he shared that I thought was cool is you can assign each student, not like on Flipgrid, but you can just tell students like, I was thinking about doing it in houses so i could tell like if you're in the amicus house then you are going to watch all of the other people who are in the amicus house watch their video and then give them a positive comment response um he talked about do ink which at first i thought was doink because <laughs> all together um it's a green screen recording app so the example he showed us was like a news reporting station where the kids were giving a news report about the main idea and key details and he had um he just found a picture of like a news reporting background on Google. And then he had a kid with a Chromebook that was playing a video on YouTube that was like the like the news reporting like music. So that when they started the video, it was like their intro to their like news report. And then also the out. So the kids are first going to create the content that they wanna talk about. Then they're going to plan what they wanna do. Like um, one of the kids, when they first came on the screen, like did the same hand gesture. Um, these two girls went out, they like said something at the same time and like faded off the screen. Um, and then they record. Let's see, another one he talked about was Quiver, um, which has these coloring pages, and then um, you use the Quiver app and it basically turns it into virtual reality. So like they're basically VR coloring pages, which is pretty cool, um, but it makes like their art come to life. So whatever they drew on that page or whatever they wrote is gonna come to 3D. Um, Twazi, I think I'm saying that right, is like a finger chooser. So if you have a phone and you have it open on the app, it didn't work for me earlier, but maybe I was doing it wrong. So you tap the screen, and then if there's another person, then it would do it a different color. I don't think it's gonna do it because my finger is the same. Okay, it did it. So it only registered this finger. So whatever color it pops up on the screen, you can see that the little dot on mine is green. So that means then the green one. Um, the app when you open it up says like, pick who's gonna do the dishes or like who's gonna take out the trash like if you're at home um, but if you're doing it in groups then you could say like okay whoever's gonna read next in our group is let's do Twazi to figure out who's gonna read next or who can go get the papers or whatever um, it's basically a way to choose students mm. oh, we shared about epic um, apparently it is like Netflix for books it's free but they do close it down at like five or six at night so if you wanted to have students read at home then the parents would have to buy a subscription or the kids would have to read like as soon as they get home so it doesn't shut off on them um, and then you can assign titles to specific students so like if you had a kid who really loved like basketball then you could find titles about basketball and then share that with him which I thought was so cool because I have a pretty extensive library but it's kind of hard for me to like go dig in and find things or um, I don't always have the time like when students are reading I'm doing my reading small group so I can't just pause what I'm doing and then go help them find a book at that moment when they need it so if I was able to assign them a book on um, epic then I wouldn't have to go search for it and the students could even find them on their own so I thought that was really cool oh wow this is getting really long I'm sorry if you're still with me you are a trooper um, and then the last session that we had was with Amy Lemons again. It was called Math More Than a Worksheet. And she basically shared all these editable documents. Um, we're gonna have a PDF afterwards that is editable so that we can create our own math games. But it was basically a bunch of different math games. So I'm gonna put a bunch of pictures on here as I'm talking so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But I feel like it's gonna be pretty hard um, for you guys to see without video. So I definitely will be sharing about the games that I'm choosing to use in my classroom and they were really cool. So we did a place value game with a spinner. Um, that could be used for a lot of different things. We did a multiplication puzzle. You could use it for any different math concept and they have to, um, you basically have this template. You can fill it in with all the different problems. They have to cut it out and then match the two sides. So it, it might be like a multiplication problem and then a product is going to match up and at the end, they'll have their whole puzzle filled out. Um, I was thinking you could do that for like vocab, antonyms or synonyms, um, arrays and repeated addition, like matching the ones that would go together, um, properties of multiplication, parts of speech, really anything. There were these number cards. Um, kids are playing with a partner. You could really use it for anything. Me and my partner used it for multiplication. So like we both flipped over two cards, multiplied them together. Whoever had the highest amount got a point and then we did it again. Um, Although you don't have to have these cards for that, I feel like you could also do that with like a deck of cards. We were also thinking that we could use it for fractions, um, comparing fractions, rounding, elapsed time, 
for example if each student had like a deck of those cards and again you could use that with a deck of cards too not just like this stack of cards that she had um we could i could say a time out loud they pull a card whatever number they pull is a number of minutes and they could either add or subtract that on a number line to the number that i said out loud um she did a toss and solve game too so you fill in the board or the students can fill in the board with different numbers you give them a pom-pom or like a cotton ball because it's silent and it's not going to make any noise when they throw it um wherever they throw it if it doesn't land perfectly in a circle then they can just push it into the closest one so they're not wasting time throwing the pom-poms again um, you could use this for rounding multiplying adding two numbers and rounding them subtraction um i know i'm going kind of fast on this but i will show you guys more specifics on the games when i actually use them in my classroom and i'll talk to you guys about how i'm using them um, and then the math bingo, you can have students fold the sheet in half and then you can either have them create their own boards using the number that you have projected on a board and then they could like put them in different places or you could just pre-make them. Although I feel like third grade would probably be able to do it themselves and it would save me so much time. So I'd be more motivated to use this game if it wasn't going to take me forever to make. Um, the way that we played it is we had all these different numbers and then Amy said a number that was um, rounded out loud. So like actually i'll just show you because i have right here so these are all the numbers that we had i filled it in based on the numbers that she had on the board and then she would say a number out loud so like she might say like 530 if we're rounding to the nearest 10 and then we'll all have it because we all use the same numbers so if this was in we had it in um a sheet protector and we had whiteboard marker which i would totally suggest because then you could use it over and over then i would just mark the x on there and then whenever someone got four in a row then they won um, you could use that for so many different things, I feel like. Um, oh, and then she also shared this really cool slide that I'll put on here too called Slide Into Math, which is basically like Kahoot but without technology. So she had the four square, there was four different colors, and then each student had a clothespin. The slide that was on the board that she did say she was going to share, so I'm super excited because it's edible and I could use it for anything. So then you have a slide on the board based on whatever answer they want to choose they put that clip on there and then hold it up so it's literally like the same thing with kahoot but you don't have to have technology to use it and you can use it for any concept and that was the last thing i wrote down so oh i'm thirsty now i feel like i've been talking for like 45 minutes whoa kicked the chair i'm using a chair as a tripod right now um i was gonna take a nap but it is 5 43 and i am supposed to be going down to the wild card kids book party at six o'clock so i need to get ready i was gonna take a nap but i definitely don't have time now so i'm just gonna go freshen up and fix my makeup really quick because the ac was not working in the room that we we're in and it was 76 degrees which might not sound that hot but when there's like 100 people in one room and you're like i don't know have all this energy and excitement and you're like moving around a bunch it was hot and i was sitting right next to the projector and it was like pushing out hot air so I need to just completely go fix my makeup. But anyways, I will take you guys with me to the Wildcard Kids book party and show you guys what it looks like. I could see in the elevator as I was coming up, um, they were setting it up and it looked really cute. They're gonna have a bunch of like big games and it's decorated all cute and they're gonna feed us, which I'm most excited about. So I'm gonna go freshen up and then I will take you down with me.